All right, part C of the overview of cloud computing or introduction to cloud computing and big data. Jeffrey Fox, your fearless instructor. Okay, folks, here we um, actually define for you the contents of this uh, lesson C, defining clouds, part two. We first discussed the really important concept of service oriented architectures. They've underlined modern systems since the early 2000s. And it basically tells you to build software services as modules all wrapped up so they're on their own. And they only communicate with the world through messages. They output stuff as messages and they input stuff as messages. That's pretty important because messages allow a separation of interests. <coughs> and it actually makes it easier to use large teams because each team can do a separate service. And that motivates microservices, which divides the server, gives you many more services to chop up and give to members of your team. Um, we have the as a service concepts, <coughs> which are generally applicable, but first came into existence through clouds, where we have network infrastructure as a service, which was the early cloud offerings, platform as a service, which is the essentially the operating system for the cloud and software as a service, which are applications. Then we highlight that Amazon and Microsoft have an amazing number of services, which keep getting more and more. There are so many services that not only you can't keep track of what they offer, but nobody can compete because you just can't. If you're a university computer center or even worse, a digital science center, you can't offer the number of anywhere near the number of services these people have. Then we look at some initial comments on clouds. When I started these, these uh, presentations in 2008 to 10, clouds were just pointing, poking out and they were considered very important, but still not established. Now they're not only just established, they're the norm. They're the things you have to compete with because they just uh, dominate. And the majority of computing is done on clouds. And there are some 50 million servers, at least soon will be 50 million servers, spread over 500 or so data centers. Then we look at the evolution of the servers, the serverless concept, which is really not serverless, it really is server hidden. There are servers there, but the user doesn't, doesn't instantiate them, the system does. The user just instantiates the software which is typically function as a service and microservices. Then we have a discussion of the infrastructure strategies, how you build a data center, what components go into it, with both the hype cycle and the priority matrix components. Thank you. All right, this uh, slide here is trying to make this stuff about uh, services and messaging clearer and what a service-oriented architecture is, as I said. The web pioneered, well, it wasn't even pioneered, it actually implemented a, ma a natural messaging model, but that's consumer to server messaging. Service oriented architectures is also server to server messaging, machine to machine messaging. Everything has an interface that accepts information and that comes either from another service or server or from a client. And also everything spits out information as messages. There was a huge amount of effort to define the format of these messages and something which was called web, web services. We will actually use something called REST, which is simpler than web services and effectively took over from web services. I remember when the entire um, IT community was designing web services, which were meant to be incredibly important and much better than the previous approach to this type of thing, which was called Corva. Unfortunately, Corva died and web services essentially died because they were too complicated and could not keep up with the rapid change of everything. <coughs> In any case, whether you use REST services, which we use, or web services, messaging always produces cleaner, modular systems because there is a clear separation linked by the message. And I've all, as I've said before, messaging is how we're talking. I'm sending a message via a video and a PowerPoint. And that message 
you pick up with your hands and govern it up with your eyes, or you listen to it with your ears. That's your way of inputting messages. And so we're doing messaging. And this is contrasted here with the, uh, the method call type of message, method of communicating, and this service method. Services send messages that are clearly separated. When I do a method call, which is much faster, I just look at the common pieces of memory. And uh, that's dangerous, as I mentioned. It could have uh, be unreliable. <coughs> All right, here we are. This is the at a service slide. Lots of as a services. The one at the top, support computing as a service, I invented. It's not so important. It just says that in the modern world, where your actual hardware could be anywhere, and your software could be anywhere, and your network could be anywhere. Really, what you one thing that can, you know has to be next to you is support. When you're struggling to get your Java, Python, MATLAB, dot 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 uh, program running, you need to have support. And so, support as a service is pretty important, and people ought to work a little more on this concept. I mean, they offer support, but our certain is articulated quite as a, as a service. Anyway, we, as I said, we started off with infrastructure as a service. That was Amazon's initial offering, because uh, that's what they had, spare machines. Then they realized they needed to do platform as a service. Actually, that was pioneered by Google. The Google App Engine was platform, the first platform as a service. It was a rather specific platform as a service and couldn't do everything. And so it actually was not probably as successful as um, it could have been if it had been a slightly more general offering. And Google itself only offered a general cloud service, including infrastructure and platform and software and network. A few years ago, I don't know, three years ago, Google Compute Engine. And they're playing catch up ever since. They missed the boat. It's interesting, they have these giant companies. And they do some things so well, other times they mess up. As far as I know, they're trying very hard and doing excellently, but they're they are clearly running way behind Microsoft and and the initial uh, pioneer Amazon. All right, I pointed out what software as a service is, um, which could be applications. It could be use of the, like software as a service. Use it's offered to support online education and open edX and things like that. Uh, Coursera. That's they they use software as a service when we. Use Open edX to do a online class where we're, we're using a software as a service application. Uh, networks as a service, I pointed out OpenFlow, the Genie project nationally, and software defined networks are providing network as a service. And so this is the, and actually we're discussing for a project I have should we offer software as a service or the download option? Put everything in GitHub, people. Click a button, and the GitHub sends a message to you with all the software that you want. Not quite clear. Don't know about software as a service. You have to use the cloud or have a cloud to be able to put it there, and it costs money to do that. So, whereas clicking a button on GitHub does not cost any money. Okay, folks, here we have the Amazon 2018 December services. 23 categories you click on. Each of these 23 uh, different uh, labels, like compute, customer engagement, storage, analytics, and so on, you'll get uh, various numbers of subservices. So, like for, we clicked on an analytics, and we got 11 subservices, including how to make a data lake, how to build a data pipeline or a workflow, how to do streaming data, Kinesis and Kafka, both are there, uh, data warehousing. Elasticsearch, querying, so that's effectively uh, SQL, Amazon SQL. And that is 11 services in the one category. And we have 23 categories, so we certainly have upwards of 100 services. Um, the next uh, overlay gives you the result of clicking on the storage button. So we now have the 23 categories at the top, and we have nine subcategories or subservices at the bottom. 
including S3, the basic Amazon object store, Glacier, their archival store, Luster lookalike, and so on. And um, this is just sort of staggering, given that all of this started off as infrastructure as a service, but none of this. This was 2008, and all of this has just happened as now the uh, the vendors compete. Originally, Amazon was infrastructure as a service, Azure was initial platform as a service, but they now offer infrastructure platform, serverless, which is function as a service, and uh, platform as a service. Everything is offered by all the vendors from Google, which uh, originally didn't have infrastructure, now has infrastructure, and so on. It's um, universal. It's not much any real better on Azure. It's just a different formatted picture, and there's a slightly more pictures in it, but not really. And um, actually, again, this one from 2015, because I couldn't find a picture dated 2017. They actually used multiple pages. They wouldn't even put them on one page, if I remember right. So that's the trouble about progress. Progress has got so big. We can't get as pretty a picture. I told you, even when I was looking at the big data applications, we all find that those pictures are old because people don't do this. It doesn't all fit in one place in this anymore. Okay, all right. Here's Gartner's wise remarks on clouds. So as they say, they've entered their second decade. They were started in, I think, 2006 by Amazon, and they were disruptive. They changed the whole way people did computing. And now they're expected. They're the norm, prevalent. And they were expected, they're actually, they're growing 20% per year, and the old approach is declining a few percent per year. Still, it's pretty confusing. People think it's cloud computing is new, and actually by some standards it is. It is only 12 years old. So there's plenty of confusion. People keep saying cloud computing is more expensive, or cloud computing is not secure. Uh, it's hard to use clouds, but none of those are probably true any longer. And most of these are just fake state, fake what's now called fake news. That's the one advantage of the recent uh, developments in the political scene. We have a concept which I didn't really know about before called fake news. So clouds being insecure is fake news. And of course, this is all um, commoditization or consumerization of IT. Um, and that's uh, basically making the whole IT organization, it should change the way it operates, because it's dealing with it. It's got a much, it's a very different, uh, less siloed and more open uh, approach to, to IT. I pointed out that the infrastructure as a service was the initial offering, but now everybody is offering platform as a service in in the always. So you can't actually get infrastructure as a service. You'll always have the ability to do to do software. And whether it's a public offering from Amazon or Microsoft, or you host your cloud and your local or rented facility, they're pretty much the same because the the softwares all do the same thing. OpenStack does the same thing as Microsoft or Amazon's com uh, commodity systems. Probably OpenStack doesn't do quite as good a system, a work, piece of work as Microsoft or Amazon, because those giant corporations have huge numbers of people they pour onto their virtualization technology. All right. All right, now we come to. Uh, an off, uh, a slide from uh, Gartner. Gartner has these so-called magic quadrants for lots of technologies, um, which they use to be able to compare the offerings of different vendors. Here we have cloud infrastructure as a service, which as we pointed out, is really not different from cloud platform as a service these days. And <coughs> they plot here ability to execute. They plot this by vision or completeness of vision. And you see up at the top here, in Amazon and Microsoft. Amazon has the most complete vision, it has the most services. And it has the most computers, so it wins in both counts. 
But this Microsoft has been catching up. And so this is 2017. If you looked at the earlier years, Amazon had a clearer lead. Here is Google, just hanging in there. As I said, they, they really sort of made a technical mistake by focusing on the app engine, which had the right idea, but wasn't completely implemented. Back here, we have three well-known large companies, Oracle, IBM, and Alibaba. Remember, Alibaba is actually bigger than Amazon, at least in terms of e-commerce. So they ought to have plenty of computers to rent. And if you read this report, which will be accessible to IU students, you will get some detailed description of each of these vendors. In these vendors here, I know some of them, like Rackspace, who actually was the pioneer that gave us OpenStack originally with NASA. Uh, Fujitsu is obviously a big company. The others I'm not so certain about. I mean, they're fine, I just don't know them. All right, here's a neat Gartner slide, evolution of server computers. And when we did cloud some um, last year, and certainly for the half a dozen years we did it before then, we offered you hypervisors, usually on KVM. We actually offered you access to Amazon, but most of it was done locally with OpenStack. And before that, Eucalyptus and Nimbus, which are previous uh, um, cloud management systems. but uh, at least we are now going to switch more or less completely to containers, uh, which will be Docker and Kubernetes, which virtualize the operating system. And they have applications as a unit of scaling here. The whole virtual machine is the unit of scaling with the operating system. And then this, on top of this, we're going to build, uh, at least probably not so much in the class, but more in our research, serverless systems. Function or function platform as a service. And this virtualizes the runtime and it has functions. The little microservices. A function is an invoked microservice running. So, microservices as a service, um, containers as a service, or hypervisors as a service. That's how server computing is evolving. And this is, this is all for user convenience. If you do this, you don't have to worry anything about computers. You just build your services. You link them with messages. That's how uh, serverless computing works. It's invoked by a message. All right. Here they have these hype cycles, which we'll describe in more detail later on. Uh, but they have these very amusing um, names, innovation trigger. The favorite one is the trough of disillusionment, which happens with the peak after the peak of inflated expectations. And then clouds, by the way, are sort of somewhere up here. And they are trailing, you know, clouds have many technologies. The core cloud technology are up in this region. Core concept up here, some of the um, uh, technologies like, say, OpenStack itself is not uh, not so uh, not uh, so quite so mature. But still, that climbing the so-called slope of enlightenment and the clouds themselves are on the plateau of productivity because they are. Yeah, that's sort of a significant fraction, if not almost 50% of all enterprise IT use. I remember when I first went to these uh, presentations on clouds, people were being controversial and saying, well, there will be 20% cloud use this year or next year. But now it's essentially 50% and people just shrug. They just accept it, or they don't accept it because they close their eyes. Anyway. They ha he, they, he has this uh, Gartner, sorry, he is uh, the organization Gartner uh, has a paper on the evolution of server computer computing, which I got the previous slide from. And um, okay, folks, here we have a Gartner on how to build the cloud data centers or the infrastructure strategies hype cycle 2018, latest from July of, of this year. And um, the key things that I've highlighted are connected to the edge <coughs> in software-defined systems. Where software-defined systems, as here, are really not defined in software. Though you have software like um, Ansible and uh, Puppet and things like that, which execute and Chef, which execute scripts, which then create the software, the virtual machines, 
the, the um, orchestrations and so on. And the advantage of having everything defined is that when you when you crash and lose it, you can recreate it. <coughs> and also, if there are somehow changes, like a software patch, you'll get that software patch automatically. Because when you rebuild the system, you'll use the the component with the software patch. Here we have edge supercomputing, the concept that uh, if you take all the systems at the edge, they add up to a lot of stuff with a lot of computing. Uh, that used to be called uh, grid or desktop computing and things like that. Um, here we have serverless computing. This red thing here points to that. Here we have the other ma another major thing, the Internet of Things. Private cloud computing is sort of critical for linking sort of sensitive things locally, but implemented as a cloud, connected to uh, the cheaper, huge, infinite resource public cloud system. That's sort of built into most people's strategy today. Here we have the same stuff presented as the priority matrix of Gartner, which we discussed earlier. We see that the critical components, Edge, remember, Microsoft has the intelligent cloud joined to the intelligent edge, giving us the AI supercomputer. So here we have edge computing, and here we have Internet of Things, which of course is the same an aspect of edge computing. We have serverless. These are all transformational. They're going to just change the way things are, are done. Here we have software-defined security. Um, here we have hyperscale computing, which is the, the very large data centers and the huge scale that big data requires. Here we have infrastructure software defined systems. So this is, here we have the security and here we have the whole infrastructure defined by scripts and implemented on demand. And when we go to the edge, we're going to need micro data centers uh, because we can't put everything in central resources. Um, when your car is about to collide with a truck, it really doesn't want to go back to the cloud to decide what to do. So here are all these components, and there are all sorts of other interesting things like container management, which is critically important, but sort of only moderately, I mean, of moderate significance because it's bound to happen and it's been done already. So that's here. So. All right, so software-defined networking, SDN, that's effectively deployed. Um, and so it changes that will probably only have moderate importance. So it's pretty all pretty exciting, thank you. It describes uh, both the three stages of servers. Um, and now it also points out you have different application models. Previously, I mean, in the beginning of time, things are monolithic, that's when uh, IT uh, organizations are really dominant. They ran on mainframes. Those mainframes switched to, to smaller computers, clusters. We had client server architectures. And then they chopped the server into multiple tiers, N tier operations, which were just a hierarchical uh, arrangement of the programs. And now we have this more flatter organization, microservices. We're doing everything at service oriented. And each of those services runs independently. And then on top, this is the application programming that lives on these are computing abstractions, virtualized servers. That's what we first started our cloud course with. Containers, which we're using now. And then next year or two years from now, we'll be using maybe all serverless and function as a service. All right, that's a pretty interesting uh, description of the. Uh, of the future, and so that ends this uh, particular uh, batch of slides, part C. Thank you very much.